All right. Well, today we're going to begin a new series called Devotion to the Rescue, where we're taking a look at how our personal devotion to Christ um, can rescue us from a lot of the, um, the, 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 the twists and turns of life, the, the things that we need to, the shoals, the things we want to avoid, the way that we want to live. Devotion can come to our rescue as we move through life. Uh, today I'm going to be reading from the book of Luke. And we're going to be looking at uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 19, and then we're going to skip a little bit and go 25 to 32. So you can look at the words on the screen, or if you like, there's a Bible in your pew back. You can take a look at that. We're going to begin, though, with uh, Luke 24, verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to the village of Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast, One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Well, what things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. Well, he said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe All that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. This is the word of God for the people of God today. And everybody said, amen, praise God, and all those good things. Yes, yes, yes. Well, it seems to me I cannot go one day without hearing the word unprecedented. Has this been your experience lately? Everything is an unprecedented crisis. It's like nothing has ever happened before. Everything is an unprecedented crisis. We have an unprecedented crisis in government. We have an unprecedented crisis of a heat wave throughout the world. We have unprecedented crisis of UFO sightings. We just have unprecedented crises everywhere, every single day. Now, I have to say that whenever I see those words together, unprecedented crisis, I always get just a little bit skeptical. My skepticism antenna always goes up because... The fact is, there's very little that's truly unprecedented in this world. Do you agree? And besides that, when we talk about unprecedented crises, I've just heard that so many times. I'm old enough to have heard that many, many times. For instance, how many of you were around in the late 60s and you heard about the unprecedented crisis of the population explosion? That was going to cause mass starvation throughout the 1970s. Anybody? Anybody remember around that same time, we were told we were facing an unprecedented crisis of what? Global cooling. You remember how we were all headed for a new ice age? And Europe, they said this, Europe was going to be covered in a glacier by the year 2000. And then, of course, there was, there was the unprecedented, unprecedented crisis, just very recently, of global warming. Do you remember? Where all the polar ice caps were supposed to be melted by 2008, and then they kind of revised that to 2014, and then to 2018, and we just don't kind of hear about that so much anymore. Whenever I hear unprecedented crisis, I'm just you know, a little skeptical. Because I also know, and you know this from your experience too, I'll bet, that there's a real big market and a lot of people benefit by keeping an atmosphere 
of crises going all the time. To have an atmosphere of just unprecedented and perpetual crisis going on. And it's deceptive. I don't like it because it's deceptive. Now, we as Christians should know, I hope we know, that we of all people should be the last ones to be deceived. Last ones to be deceived about any sort of big warnings or big crises or big, you know, big, big events going on. The least ones to be deceived because we know that there's an antidote to deception. And what is it? Truth. The antidote to deception is truth. And we know where to go for the truth. Amen? We know where to go for the truth. We know that we can go to Scripture, that Scripture is the antidote to deception. That our devotion to studying the Scriptures, that our devotion to a personal and trusting relationship with Jesus Christ, and our devotion to His true church. That, by the way, if it is a true church, it's going to be focusing on the first two, uh, the Scripture and personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So when we're focused on those things, when we're devoted to those things, we're spared. We're spared a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the depression, a lot of the, the confusion that comes along with deception. Deception. And you know who's the number one person who loves to see us deceived? The enemy. The enemy wants to see us deceived. Because when he can successfully deceive us, he can break our trust in God. So Paul said this. He said, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme." And again, that's the devil's big scheme. Separate us from God through deception. Separate us from God through deception. And the, the armor that he's talking about, that Paul's talking about, is the truth. The truth that we find in Scripture. And this passage that I just read, this story, I think is just such a great example of the triumph of God's Word over deep, fake deception. Deep fake deception. Now, this story it comes to us from the book of Luke, and it actually took place on the first Easter, the Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead, and then he began to make his appearances to his disciples around Jerusalem. But the fact is, a lot of Jesus' followers uh, were already out of town by then. They had, and at least these two guys, had definitely decided that it wasn't a good place to be sticking around, that there was no reason to remain in, a, in Jerusalem, and that as a matter of fact, it was probably a little dangerous to do that. So these two men, these followers of Jesus, had already left Jerusalem. And they were walking together to a village nearby called Emmaus, about seven miles away. And they're walking towards Emmaus, leaving everything that they'd experienced with Jesus behind. Walking to Emmaus with long faces, kind of drooping shoulders, you know. But as they were walking, a stranger came up and began to walk with them. Now, Luke wants us to know us who were hearing the story and who were reading this story for the first time, that this stranger was no, he was Jesus. He was actually Jesus. But that somehow, some way, these two men supernaturally had been shielded, had been prohibited from recognizing that this stranger was actually Jesus. Well, the stranger came up to them, and they're walking along. He comes up, walks alongside them, and he asks them, he says, what are you discussing as you, as you go along? And these two men, they kind of just like stop dead in their tracks, and the way I imagine it, they're just like looking at this guy, this stranger, and they'll go like, what? 
how can, what, where have you come from? How can you even ask us that question? Aren't you up on the unprecedented crisis that's been going on in Jerusalem? How can you ask us this question? And as a matter of fact, I mean, he practically says that. He says, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And it is a little bit like us, you know, when we run into somebody who's not spun up the same way we are about something going on in the world, and we're like, where have you been, man? Why aren't you upset about this? Look what's happening. You know, we get super focused on the unprecedented crisis of the moment, the thing right before us. Well, these guys are like that. They're like, man, are you kidding me that you don't know what happened in Jerusalem? Well, apparently the stranger is like, no, haven't heard much. So they go on to explain it. They reply, the things that happened about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Everybody was just, just, just excited about Jesus. People thought that Jesus was the Messiah. They were crazy for Jesus. They go on, but the chief priests and our rulers, the people that they trusted, by the way, handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. They crucified him. But then they, they go on, and this is really the crux of the matter. He said, we had hoped, we'd hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. In other words, that's the whole reason that they are walking towards Emmaus right now and not celebrating at the gates of Jerusalem the victory of their conquering hero. Because from their point of view, the way that they're looking at things right now, Jesus was not a conqueror. He was not a hero. Jesus was just dead. And there is nothing more definitive, nothing more destroying of hope Nothing more true than death. But the thing about it is, the stranger, who is Jesus, sort of has a different view of that, doesn't he? He has a different view. And he comes back at them with all of their, 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 their hope being gone, their Decide in the decision that, this, that death was the end of everything. He comes back at them and he says, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. In other words, all this, this, this downcast feeling you have about what's happened in Jerusalem, perhaps you're being deceived. Perhaps you're being deceived. And then he goes back, and beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them everything that was said in the Scriptures concerning himself. Explained everything in the Scriptures concerning himself. Now, nobody knows exactly what Jesus, you know, what parts of the Old Testament that Jesus went to in order to bring them up to speed on what's going on with the Messiah. But we can... Speculate. It's not that hard to speculate. I think it's entirely possible that Jesus began by going back to the writings of Moses to Genesis. Genesis in chapter 3 with the fall of Adam and Eve. How they were deceived by Satan into believing that they could be like God. They could call the shots. They could be like God if only they would rebel against God. And at that time, when the fall of mankind came and sin came into the world, God came also, and He came with a promise. He promised at that time that Satan, the deceiver, would not win this war, would not win this battle. He said that there would be a person, an offspring of a woman, a Savior, who would come, and while 
the enemy, while the deceiver would, would strike at his heel, he would crush the enemy's head. He promised that evil, that Satan, that sin would one day be destroyed by the Savior. So I'm sure, or I think, he probably went back to the beginning, to that promise. But then, probably moved into the prophets. Went into the prophet of Isaiah to kind of help these men understand the kind of person that this Messiah really was. That maybe the Messiah was not exactly the kind of person that they had envisioned, that they believed would come. That actually, this Messiah... Isaiah said, would be a man who was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. That actually this Messiah would not be a conquering hero. He wasn't going to come wielding a sword, but rather he would be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. So I think Jesus probably went back. He brought them up to speed on this promise. He reminded them of the person that this Messiah was predicted to be. And actually that God had a purpose for him to be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. And at that point, I just wonder if maybe those men from Emmaus also began to go through the Rolodex of Scripture in their minds and maybe found or remembered Psalm 22 that also describes this Messiah in a whole different way. Psalm 22 that had a vision of the Messiah crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All who see me mock me. They hurl insults. They're shaking their heads. I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. And I just wonder if those men from Emmaus might have gone back in their minds just a couple of days to what they probably witnessed at the place of the skull. And they crucified Jesus. And now they're beginning to put all of these pieces together. But Jesus wasn't done He probably went back to Isaiah and talked to them about God's plan for this Messiah. That's very different than their vision of this plan. That his plan, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And that the Lord would make his life an offering for sin. whole different idea about what really went on in that unprecedented crisis of those days in Jerusalem. A whole different idea. And then, as they neared Emmaus, I would imagine that this stranger took them to the Probably the greatest prediction about this Messiah. Another prediction from Isaiah. That even though he would suffer and die, he would see his offspring and prolong his days. That after he suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. And I wonder if Hearing about all of that, the promise of God to defeat evil, the person of this Messiah who's maybe just a little different than they thought, the purpose and the plan for this Messiah, God's purpose and plan, and then this prediction that he would live, I just wonder if those men from Emmaus, if their eyes just got giant. And that they began to remember what their women, the women who were in their group on that day, on that Sunday, had told them that they had gone to the tomb early in the morning, but they didn't find his body. 
that they came and they told them that they'd seen visions of angels who said that he, Jesus, was alive. I just wonder if all of those things began to click in their minds and if what that wasn't just about the time when Scripture, as it describes, their hearts began to burn within them. Burn with a brand new hope. Burn with the realization that maybe death wasn't as definitive as they thought. That maybe death was not the destroyer of hope. And that maybe, maybe life was the truth. See, the evil one, you know, Satan, his big scheme is to always be dividing us from God, breaking up, you know, our trust in him. He does it by deception. He does it by keeping our eyes on all the unprecedented uh, big crises that are going on that shake our confidence in God. But the one thing that the evil one wants to do more than anything else is deceive us about death, to get us focused on death, to make us fearful of death. Because, let's face it, it's that fear of death shakes our confidence in God. It's the fear of death that makes us cling maybe a little too tightly to this world. It's our fear of death that magnifies all of those failures and all those regrets we have about what we accomplished or didn't accomplish in life. It's that fear of death that just, just shakes us. But when we are in the Word, the way Jesus was, we're in the world. We make it difficult for the enemy to shake our confidence because that's where we find the truth, the truth that death is a great deception, that death cannot stop God from fulfilling his promises. Death cannot stop God from fulfilling his plan for you and for me and for all the people that will come after us, that this great arc of history in the world is really in God's hands. It's a fear of death that can shake our hopes. But it's the truth of life that can make that hope burn within us no matter what's going on. In the end, death is a deep fake, but life is the truth. Paul said, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the truth. This is the truth that's revealed to us by the resurrection of Jesus. The truth that is revealed in Scripture. The truth that gives us the assurance that death, death is the deep faith. Life is the truth. For those men, they, they got to their destination. Haven't heard all this from Jesus. And it appeared that the stranger was ready to just move on, just go on. But these guys, they were so, so excited about everything that he'd said. This new hope had been drawn up and welled up inside them to such an extent they didn't want him to go. They begged him to stay. They said, no, come on inside. And because they asked him, he went. The stranger went inside. 
but he didn't stay a stranger very long. For as they went inside and they sat down together at the table, Jesus, a stranger, took bread and he broke it. He gave it to each of them. As he did that, he gave them this bread. Their eyes were open. They saw the truth, the whole truth, the most important truth, that Jesus lived. They saw it. They knew that because he lives, hope would live. We can know that same thing because he lives. The truth, the truth is that life goes on with God. Beginning right now, for those who believe. I want you to raise your hand today if you're a believer today. You believe in this God who's given His Son that we might all live. If today anyone here, anyone out there is looking down that, that tunnel towards death and you feel that fear, oh, I just want you to Reach out to your Father in heaven. He wants only that you will come to know Him in the truth. That He lives. That you and I, all of us, can live with Him and in Him, beginning now and into eternity. Just ask Him to show you the truth. Next week, we're going to take a look at how devotion, our personal devotions, can really help us when we're struggling to know what, what's the right thing to do. What should we do? But this week, let's just do remember the enemy really does want us to be focused and all spun up about all of the different things going on and all the crises. And I'm not saying that the world isn't chaotic, and I'm not saying it's not confused. You know how I feel about all of that. But I don't want us to miss the truth. The truth that within all of that, cutting through all of that, is life. For those who believe, that's life. It begins now and goes on forever. Amen? Amen.